for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Wednesday afternoon, December the 27th, 1995. Dr. Bill Null is the speaker of the afternoon should, uh, from Salina, Kansas. This is one of toots of the afternoon service. Lord, we just praise you and bless you. We just glorify you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Well, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, we come before you now, Lord. We ask for blessing on your word, Lord God. Lord, make it life. Make it spirit. Make it life. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. I spoke last time, at the last camp meeting, I spoke on the weapons of our warfare. And uh, when I got home, God spoke to me and said I should have presented it differently to you. And so today I'm going to speak, I'm going to start by speaking a little bit about the weapons of our warfare, which is found in Ephesians 6.18. And then I'm going to speak to you about the power of the spoken word. The, uh, because what you say is important. It has tremendous implications. Let's look at Ephesians first. Ephesians 6. We won't spend very long on this, I hope. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, put on the whole arm of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemings of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Most people stop at the end of verse 17, but verse 18 is also one of your weapons. You know, the weapons spoken of here, first, you're wrestling not against the... Uh, the Living Bible says you don't wrestle against an enemy with a body, not a body as you know it. You wrestle against spiritual beings. You can't see your enemy. Sometimes God will open your spiritual eyes and allow you to. But your enemy is a spirit. And you don't fight him with a long stick or a cannon or a gun. You fight him at very close quarters, wrestling. I used to be a wrestler in college. And I can tell you wrestling employs every muscle in your body employs your mind. You have to be quick. You have to think for every move that's a counter move. And you've got to know those counter moves so well that they become second nature to you. And the same is true when you're fighting the devil, the evil one. You've got to know how to counter all of his moves. And you've got to know how to do it instinctively by the Spirit because it is spiritually discerned and is spiritually mediated through your mouth. There are two types of weapons. First, the defensive ones. It says in Psalm 91, verse 4, He who abides, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
Now, God is a spirit. If you keep your finger there in Psalm 91 and go over to Matthew verse 6, chapter 6, look at verse 6. It says, Your Father who is in the secret place. And verse 18, Your Father who is in the secret place. Your Father abides. And if you dwell with Him, and that's resurrection ground. In Ephesians 2, 6, it says in Ephesians, well, let's look at Ephesians again. Keep your finger in Psalm 91 and go back over to Ephesians. Chapter 120, it says, "...which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this world, but the world to come." Jesus Christ stands on the throne, sits on the throne of God in the third heaven. It says down here in verse 2, 6, chapter 2, verse 6, And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. And when you're sitting there in resurrection ground, when you've been raised up with him, then you will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And that word abide there is the Hebrew word which means to spend the night. But you can go to sleep at night. <coughs> And no, praise you, Lord Jesus. It says under his, verse 4, it says, Under, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. Jesus in Matthew 23 said, he used a simile. Matthew 23, verse 37, says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stoned those who are sent to you, how often I want to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. That's also repeated in, in Luke 13:34. So you have to be willing, and He is your refuge and your fortress. And so if you abide and stand there in the defensive place, if you're raised with Jesus Christ and you sit with Him, and you can abide at night in a safe place. Let's go back now and look at the rest of it. Ephesians. You stand, therefore, having your waist girded with truth. We spent the whole hour and a half talking about truth this afternoon to the men. Truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. John says, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the light, and the truth. No one comes to the Father except by me. So he is the truth. Now the girdle, the simile of the Roman soldier was that the girdle held up the sword. The sword was attached to the girdle. But it was around his waist and he pulled the loose gown that he wore. He pulled it up and tucked it into his girdle so he wouldn't trip over it. Tell, the, tell a lie, it'll trip you up, gentlemen. That's the thing about lies. You know, being honest is very practical. You only have one thing to remember. If you're going to lie, then you've got to remember what the truth is, and you've got to remember what you said and who you said it to, and what kind of lie you told to prop up the first one. Praise you, Jesus. The breastplate of righteousness. Jesus Christ is your righteousness. Not by works you have done. We sang in Titus. But Jesus is your righteousness. Romans 14, Romans 10, Lord God. 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He is your righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says, Of Him you are in Jesus Christ, and He is your righteousness, your redemption, and your sanctification. Jesus is your, is your righteousness. Once when I got saved, when I got saved, you know, and about, I guess it was about a year, and after I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and God began to use me, I got the feeling that God had gotten a pretty good deal. You know, I thought God done pretty good when He saved me. Mm -hmm. And His kingdom got a pretty good deal. One day, uh, I was studying one night, and I was carried away in a vision to the temple. And he carried me down a, uh, a passageway and told me to dig through a hole in the wall. And I, in this vision I dug through, 
and I was a door, and I opened the door, and in, in, in this room was this absolutely despicable thing. It was a sexual orgy, both, both sex were involved, uh, both heterosexual and homosexual. And it was the most despicable thing. I just got nauseated. I almost vomited when I saw it. And I asked him why. And he said, that is what your righteousness looks like to me. It's a stench in my life. And it took a missionary friend of mine the next day as I was describing it to him. He said, Bill, I'm certainly glad that Jesus Christ is my righteousness. <laughs> then God made it life to me. He spoke God's word to me. And I got down and I repented. I thanked God. Jesus Christ is your righteousness, not by your works. Stand in the righteousness, the gift of God. Stand holding at the breastplate to protect your heart. Out of it comes the issues of life. The breastplate of righteousness stands in your heart, covers your heart. And out of it comes the issues of life. And so you wear the girdle of truth to hold up your clothes and keep you from getting tripped up. You wear the breastplate of righteousness to protect your heart. For out of it comes the issues of life. You wear the shield of faith by which you're able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. That's a big shield. It's not a little shield. It's a big shield that the Romans were able to stand in protected the entire man. You were able to get behind it. So when the devil shoots his arrows at you, when the spoken words come against you, the curses come against you, they won't pierce you through. All those things are defensive. And the last thing is you put on the helmet of salvation and... Second, uh, First Thessalonians calls it the helmet of the hope of salvation. Hope. Faith is for today. Hope is for the future. Hope is a firm expectation of good that's going to occur in the future. Now, I tell you, if you ain't got any hopes, and now about it, faith, hope, and charity. If you don't have any hope, you don't have anything in hope that things are going to get better. And the devil will hit you with that in your mind. It's not going to ever be any better. It's always going to be this way. It's always going to be this hard. You're going to have to stand and stand, and he's going to beat you to death, and you just have to stand in faith. It won't ever get any better. That's what the devil wants you to think. He is steal your hope. But things are going to get better. You're going to push him back. You're going to push him back, and you're going to win. He's not going to always be able to beat on you. There's an end. That's the hope of salvation. Salvation is healing and deliverance and wholeness. It's not just getting saved, coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is having all your needs met, complete healing. The most, one of the most common words used by Jesus for healing was salvo, which means salvation. He says he was made whole. That means salvo, salvation, healing. That's the hope of healing and being whole. Well, those are all defensive. Just to ward off the enemy. Then you say, and taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the spoken word of God, that word of God is rhema word. This is the Logos. This is the written word of God. The whole counsel of God. The rhema word is that verse that God gives you for a specific situation. Now, where does that occur? Well, let's look in Matthew 4. Jesus used that when he stood against the devil. Matthew 4, 4. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, every spoken word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That was the rhema for that situation. God will give you a verse that will come forth with his Spirit. When you're fighting the devil, you stand against him with the Word of God. Specifically, the Word that God gives you, the rhema Word for that situation, that's the reason it is necessary and important that you feed on this and that you plant it in your heart, which says the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all things. And I'm going to tell you something. The devil's not going to hit you when you're at home at your study desk and you've got your concordance in your Bible. He'll hit you when you're going down the freeway. And that sense of heaviness will come over you. That sense of guilt will come over you. That sense of anger or rage will come over you. That sense of lust will come over you. He'll hit you with an arrow. And yet stand against it. 
and He will give you a verse, a rhema verse to stand against it. The Word of God. And that's the defensive weapon. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. I don't mean to preach the whole thing today. But... Oh, Jesus. The sword of the Spirit is divided into three things. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the great and mighty promises in the Bible. There are 3,000 promises in the Bible. Most of them are conditional. Most of them are conditional. Some of them are not. You need to read them in context to see whether they're conditional or not. I've seen people take one of them is, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. How many folks have you ever heard repeat that, quote that, resist the devil and he'll flee from you? Resist the devil. I resisted him. He ate me up. Look at James 4. That's James 4. And it says that. It does say resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But let's read it. And it says, it says right here, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, because of that, Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so the condition, first thing is that you humble yourself before God. For God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. That word resist there means stands in full battle array against. God will stand against you when you're proud. I forget which translation says God. That says God gives grace to the, gives grace to the humble and the proud he puts far off. Therefore, submit to God. But that's, that's a conditional promise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And the, and the last thing is, it's the Word of God. The last thing is praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful with all preservation and supplication for all schemes. So let's look at it. Praying always. Always pray. Pray in tongues when you ain't got anything else to do. You ride down the freeway. Pray in tongues. Don't be talking to yourself. Don't be fantasizing. This good deal, good business deal you could have made, and how much money you could have made, and what you're going to spend it on. Or what you could have said to that person who put you down, and how you could have answered them and got them back. You're sitting there talking to yourself, praying tongues. Praying always. In all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. Being watchful. What does it mean to be watchful? Watch means to pray all night. It means to sit up at night and pray. A prayer watch is one that goes 24 hours. It means to deny the flesh, fast, to this end with all perseverance. Persevere in prayer. I really didn't understand what that meant meant until about about ten years ago, twelve years ago. God gave me a burden to pray for prisoners, specifically for the Christian prisoners that were in the gulag in, in Russia. And I just I didn't know any of them. I began praying and I met one of Brother Andrew's representatives, and so I wrote them then. And they were starting a seven-year prayer chain, seven-year prayer cycle for Russia, and they were starting to get the names of Russian prisoners, Christian prisoners, and they sent me a Vita sheet on one. He was a Catholic priest, a spirit-filled Catholic priest from the Ukraine who was in some mental hospital way out in Siberia, and his sin was, his his crime was that he taught little children about Jesus Christ. That was his crime. They had declared him insane and put him in this hospital, in mental hospital, and told him they're going to never let him out. That's the one they gave me to pray for. And I put that beat of sheet up on my door of my refrigerator, and I ran it through my Xerox machine, and I put one in my office by my desk, and I put one in my bedroom, and I put one in the prayer room, and the intercessor's room, and... And I pestered God to death about Alexander. I prayed for him coming to go into work. I prayed for him coming home. And I pestered God to death. And eight months later, I got a letter. They said they turned him loose. They turned him loose. They just sent him home. Nobody really knew why. They just sent him home. They just sent the man home. And he opened up his church and started preaching and teaching little kids again, and they left him alone. I wrote him and told him I could pray for two folks. <laughs> Send me two. And I began to pick up names to pray for at the end of six years. There weren't any prisoners left to pray for. 
they weren't there with we had 1,500 people in the Jericho force to pray for the prisoners. And after two, after six years, there weren't any prisoners left. There weren't any prisoners left that we knew of. At the end of the seventh year, the Berlin Wall fell. Now, they said they didn't understand why that wall fell down. I know why that wall came down. Yeah. I know why. I could sit and talk all day about the things that happened to me. But the point I wanted to make to you is be persistent. Be persistent in what God gives you. When He gives you a burden, He gives you a burden for family. I got family members I've been praying for 20 years for that He's given me a burden for. When he gives you a burden, be persistent and pray. Pray. And don't look in the natural. I looked in the natural and I didn't see how that, that I didn't see how Alexander would ever get home. They wouldn't even let anybody visit him. He just had one relative, his mother who was 80 years old and had heart trouble and couldn't travel. They wouldn't even let anybody visit him out there. But God. Now, I could sit and talk all day about the others. I had 15 people all told. I still have the video sheets at home. Whenever my faith, whenever I get down a little bit, I just pick them up and read them and begin to weep. At God's goodness, and His graciousness, and His faithfulness. People, I tell you, He's faithful. When He calls you to do something, He's faithful. Pray. Pray. He gives you burdens. Sometimes He'll wake you up in the middle of the night to pray. And you won't know what you're praying for. But it doesn't make any difference. He knows. Be faithful. Be faithful. Watch. Praise your Lord Jesus. And so, those are the weapons. Now today, I want to talk to you about the spoken word. Because all spiritual weapons of attack are spoken. They're spoken. Praise is spoken. Prayers are spoken. Confessions are spoken. Proclamations are spoken. They're launched out of your mouth. The devil launches weapons, too, out of the mouth of his servants. Curses come out of the mouth of his servant. Curses affect you. And we're going to talk about the power of the spoken word. The devil can even get you to curse yourself. He can get you to curse your children, get you angry and mad, get you to cursing your children, cursing your loved ones, cursing your pastor, your boss, your job. And don't think that those words don't have power. This, let's look at Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18.21, Proverbs 18 has a number. Verse 8 says, The words of a talebearer like tasty morsels that go down into the innermost parts of the body. 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it and are safe. 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit. If you love... Well, let's look at Matthew now. Let's turn over to Matthew 12 and see what Jesus said about it. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Start with 35, 34. Brood of vipers. He's talking to the religious folks of his time now, the church folks. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you want necessarily to have the breastplate of righteousness on you? To protect your heart. A good man out of the good treasure brings forth good things, and the evil man brings out evil treasures, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give account on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. My vision of that 20 years ago was in Revelation, it says the books will be opened. Well, the word in the Greek is scroll, you know, something wound up. And I envisioned an electromagnetic tape. And on this tape was recorded everything that you said. And when you got up there, God played it back for you. And you see it on the big screen up there. There it is. There you were. You'll be judged by it. That's what the Bible says. You will be judged. Thank God he's got a bulk eraser, and the bulk eraser is called the blood of Jesus Christ. 
you know, just sweep the bulk of vapor across the electronic tape, and it will just erase it away. There's a bulk eraser. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus died for us. But every idle word, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And Acts says, repent and be baptized because your sins have been forgiven. And so re confession and repentance are a necessary part of the bulk eraser. It's not automatic. Everything is conditional. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Now let's look at Psalm 109, verse 17. And here we will see, talking about a man who has returned to evil for good. No, it's not Psalm 109. I got here he's talking about a man who's returned to evil for good. And this psalm has such a curse in it, it's used by professional witches to curse people. They will get the, book, the Bible out and read this curse out of the Bible because it covers everything. Uh, witches use the Word of God out of context. They will read curses out of the Word of God. Uh, I once uh, saw a thing that says, Make your word come to pass. And, and I sent off and bought this thing. And what it was, it was a book that showed me how to make the altar and what color candles to use. And it gave me all the Bible verses to curse my enemies. I couldn't burn it fast enough. But it was uh, just... And, and then some people in my prayer group brought me two or three other issues that I'd never seen. I just looked at them and they said, We have these books at home. This is what we've been praying by. They just didn't know they were ignorant. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay. Praise your Lord Jesus. It says him, and you notice it said, those who love it will eat its fruit. Now look at verse 17. As he loved curses, so let it come on him. As he did not delight in blessing, let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing, as with his garment, so let it enter his body like water, or like oil into his bones. Let it be to him like a garment which covers him, a belt which he girds himself continually. Let this be the Lord's reward to my accusers, those who speak evil against my person. Now, we'll come back to this later, this last part. But I want you to see here that those who love it will eat its fruit. You love to curse, God will let you have them. He'll let them come back to you. Praise you, Jesus. Now, James 3.8 says that, let's see what James says about the tongue. He says, no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. No man can, can, can tame the tongue. What can tame the tongue? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the most unruly member of your body and subjects it and brings it forth a heavenly language. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. For out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be. James says they ought not be, but they do happen. And then he goes on to say that uh, can a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water out of the same offer? Can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine figs? No. Those things don't happen. But... Out of man's mouth, from his tongue, will come both cursings and blessings. You have to choose. God allows you to choose which one you're going to love. What kind of words are going to come out of your mouth? And he will give you power by the Holy Spirit to do this. Let's look at Matthew 12:34. We've read that one. Let's look back at Matthew 12:34 again. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart? Now, if you look at Luke 6.45, it says the same thing. A good man, a good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And what that means is, what do you feed your heart on? What are you feeding it on? Are you feeding it the Word of God? Are you going to church and listening to an anointed pastor speak forth the rhema Word of God? Did you know that if you go, it has been shown, that if you go 
to an anointed full gospel church and you hear an anointed full gospel pastor speak forth the rhema word of God, one that he sat down and prayed for and said, God, give me the word for this day. I mean, I'm talking about somebody who gets his sermons from the mail order house or dust off one he had five years ago and because he's too busy with his golf game and he comes down and reads it and it's dead and lifeless. And he says, well, it's the word of God. I'm talking about one that's been anointed for that day, that you will get more help than going to a psychiatrist. And for years, mental illness was treated this way. Now pastors can get sued for malpractice. The church can sue the church for malpractice if you don't send him to an ungodly counselor. Praise you, Jesus. Okay. Scripture clearly tells us that we're not to curse or speak evil of others. James 4.10 says, don't speak evil of others. Romans, let's look at Romans uh, 12.14. I can quote all these verses, but i like for you to see them. Because it's shown that you remember about 40% of what you hear, but you remember about 80% of what you hear and see and read. And if you write it down, it's much better. So take notes on it. 12.14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Matthew 5.44 says, Pray for those who hurt you. Let's look at Matthew 5.44. It says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good for those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. When you really sit down and labor in prayer for your enemies and ask God to bless them, you will become a child of your Father who is in heaven. You can look over in Luke 6.45. It says the same thing. Matthew 15.18 says, Praise you, Lord. Well, it says, For out of the mouth comes those things which defile you. People, I have people come to me that have unforgiveness. Somebody has hurt them very badly in the past. And they said, I have I forgiven them, I've forgiven them, and I've forgiven them, but it keeps coming back. Do you get out and labor in prayer for them and ask God to bless them? And they say, no. I say, do that, and God will heal you. God will heal you. Let's look over in the... In Psalm 35, here David has been praying for some people who have rewarded him evil for good to the sorrow of his soul. And he says, My, but as for me, when they were sick, it's 35:13. as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. And my prayer would return to my own bosom. Now, you want to see another place that word is used. Let's look at Jeremiah 18, 32, 18. Just keep your place finger in Psalms and come back to Jeremiah 32:18. And here it says, he's speaking of the character of God. It says, You show loving kindness to thousands. And repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. But in this case, it's not iniquities that's coming back. It's prayers, blessings. David's fasting for them and praying for them. And he says, those prayers have come back into my bosom. Now, when you pray for your enemies... God will decide what to do with them. He is the judge. It's not up to you. You're just commanded to pray for them. God decides what's going to happen. But if they don't get the blessing you do, it'll come back to you. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let's look over at Psalm 64 while we're talking about the spoken word here. And getting a little... While we're talking about that, let's look at Psalm 64. And here we're talking about David is praying for protection. 
In verse 2, he says, Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity. Verse 3, Who shore from their tongue, like a sower, who bend their bows to shoot their arrows, bitter words. See, now he's saying those are the fiery darts of the evil one that you're holding up that shield of faith against. Bitter words. That they may shoot at secret the blameless, so they shoot at him and do not fear. Those are curses they're sending out. Now look down at verse 7. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they shall be wounded. He will make them stumble over their own tongue. Now, in Proverbs, it says, A curse causeless cannot alight. These bitter words that come forth, there's no cause for it, it won't alight. I had a friend, before he got saved, was a professional or semi-professional curse caster. His father had been a Swedish curse caster before him. He lived in a, a northern city. There was a broken down old building on the outskirts that was part of the Underground Railway that slaves used to go north to get to Canada. And lots of them apparently had died there. And he his, that was the building that he would go out to do his thing. His wife said, My God, what are you in this building? It's the spookiest place I've ever been. He said, Oh, it's marvelous, him. Can't you just feel it? He said, It's just spooky. I just want to go home. You stay here. I'm going home. And he would make a, an altar and he'd put his candles up and he would do his incantations and do his thing. And he said, This black cloud would form over the altar. And he would pronounce the curse and send it out. He, but he was always very careful before he ever pronounced a curse on anyone. He wanted to make sure that there was a reason for that curse to light. Because he had learned from bitter experience if it wasn't, if it wasn't, they didn't have a reason for that curse to light, it'd come back on him. Those are spoken words, people. Going out with the power of the enemy. Now, you know, you have two kingdoms in you. You have two kingdoms. You have two natures. You have a nature that was birthed by the incorruptible seed of God that cannot sin. It says in 1 John, He who is born of God has an incorruptible nature of God and does not sin. Now, I'm afraid that that means that after I was born again that I didn't sin, I'd have to say that there's something wrong. But it means there's a nature within you, a kingdom within you, that won't sin. And it's the one that's been birthed by the Spirit of God. There's another kingdom in you. Let's look at Luke 11, verse 17 to 20. But he, he and Jesus have been casting out demons, and they said, by Beelzebub he cast out demons. He said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. A house divided falls. If Satan is divided against him, Satan, how can his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Two kingdoms. Now, you want to know, well, how much of a kingdom you got? How honest are you? Now, Jesus Christ is the truth. John 14, 6 says, I am the light, the way. The truth. Hebrew 6.15 says, By two immutable things it is impossible for God to lie. Titus 1.2 says, It is impossible for God to lie. Let's look at John 8.44. It says, You are of your father the devil, and the desire or the lust of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because he has no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. When you speak a lie, you're speaking out of the kingdom of darkness. The, the spirit of the enemy goes forth when you lie. Even a little white lie, even a joke, God doesn't like jokers. Keep your finger in John, and let's go over to Proverbs 26. 
Proverbs 26, 18 says, Like a madman who throws five brands and errors and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. Does that touch any of you? It touched me when I read it. Now, Jesus said about the devil in John 14.30, He said, I will no longer talk with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Jesus couldn't lie, because He said He didn't have any of the kingdom of the devil in Him. That's just one test. Just remember, when you lie, know whose spirit goes with it. It's not the Holy Spirit. When you tell your children about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, Tooth Fairy, I don't believe in lying to children about anything. Now, there's sometimes I tell them I, I, don't, I don't answer. Most of the time I give them a very simple answer. A simple, honest answer will satisfy most children. I always remember the lady who came in and told me that a child had came, that came in to her and asked her, said, Mother, where did I come from? And he was in the first grade, and she was very concerned, and she'd read all the books about the birds and the bees. And so she sat down, and she talked to him for 15 to 20 minutes about the birds and the bees. And he said, well, thank you, Mother. I just wondered. Johnny came from Chicago. I just wondered where I came from. Sometimes it's wise to ask, to ask questions before you get involved. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Holy. Now, in Luke 9, let's look at, uh, at the disciples. Let's look at Luke 9, 53 to 55. In this passage, Jesus was going back to Jerusalem, and he sent his disciples ahead to a Samaritan village, and they said, we don't want him here. And they came back and said, Master... Shall we call down fire like Elijah did on these people? And Jesus said in 55, he turned and rebuked them and said, You don't know what man of spirit you are. You don't know which spirit you're speaking out of. You're not speaking out of the Holy Spirit. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. See, they were, they were speaking. Now, First Colossians 1.13 says, He's delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us in the kingdom of the Son of His love. <coughs> so, you have those two kingdoms. And when you speak for them, you want to speak out of the kingdom of God. You want His Spirit to go forth with your words. That's the reason it says over here in Ephesians, let's look over to Ephesians. Now, we talked, y'all, we talked about that this afternoon. That was a beautiful, I like that, uh, the uh, amplified version. I couldn't get all those nice words. 4.29. Just let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for the necessary building up that it can impart grace to the hearer. If you got something good to say, don't say anything. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. When you start tearing people down, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're grieving Him. Not all bitterness or rebellion. Bitterness and rebellion come from the same Greek root, the Hebrew root. Wrath, anger, clamor, loud talking, evil speaking, malice. To be kind one to another, forgiving as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Now, you see which spirits. The first is the spirit of the world, bitterness, anger, wrath, clamor, evil speaking. Don't let that come out of your mouth. That defiles you. And the enemy spirit comes with it. I keep talking about the spirit that comes. Let's look at Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55.10. And it says, as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and does not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that which I please and shall prosper the thing for which I send it. See, it's going forth from God's mouth with His Spirit. Now, keep your finger there in Isaiah, because we're going to be back in a minute. And let's go to Psalm 
Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. It's his breath that goes forth with that word will prosper what God sends it for. Now, we've seen that the bitter words are also active and alive. I had a, a, a hard time. I was raised uh, as a scientist. Math was my specialty. And all science, math is the only science, true science. This is the end of Part A. Please play Part B. Thank you. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.